Questions to the Minister for the Economy. I call Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Ms. Bradshaw. I welcome Belfast Chamber of Trade and Commerce's Belfast Manifesto and share their vision to make Belfast a world-class city. The publication of this document is timely as my department is currently taking forward the refocus of the Executive's economic strategy, which will recognise the importance of cities as drivers of economic growth. We will work closely with the Belfast Chamber and other key stakeholders and will listen to businesses and their representatives as we seek to develop and implement this strategy. My department will work closely with all relevant organisations, including the Belfast Chamber, throughout the development and implementation of the programme for government and economic strategy to ensure that Belfast develops as a city and Northern Ireland develops as a region. For a thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for your answer. Um, can I ask uh, the Minister what discussions he has had to, to secure more money as a proportion of the overall executive budget for skills to continue to address the skills so shortage as referenced in the Chamber's manifesto? Look, I, I think the, the issue of, of, of skills is an incredibly important one uh, for the Northern Ireland economy. The one thing that I'm, I'm sort of increasingly aware of in this job, um, particularly whenever we're making um, job announcements as we were last week, um, so another 94 jobs for, for the city, um, based in the city, um, is that Northern Ireland's skill offering is, is one of the things that differentiates us and sets us apart from other uh, regions who we're competing with. Um, it was very interesting in, in the conversation that I had with Metaswitch last week that, that the differentiator uh, for them coming here rather than somewhere else uh, was the Assured Skills program that we had in place, which has been in incredibly successful in terms of promoting um, for over 5,600 jobs since, 20, uh, since 2011, and that's where we work with foreign direct investors or indeed existing investors uh, and indigenous firms to ensure that they get the skills pipeline that they require. Uh, and the members identified an issue around, around funding and uh, I'm sure that every minister who comes into this house has issues and pressures in respect of elements of their budget. Uh, I know that the skills budget has been, been under pressure in the last number of years. Uh, and if we are to maintain our, our primary position, if we are to maintain uh, that ability to attract inward investment, to grow our economy, uh, then we do need to, to focus uh, much of those precious resources on ensuring that our skills, uh, our, our skills, the skills of our workforce are in place, and though the skills of those coming through our universities, our colleges, and our schools are, are up to scratch and are fit for, for the workplace. So I, look, I, I, I think it is an incredibly important area, and there are a lot of challenges that my department faces uh, around a whole range of different areas. But I, I do see uh, skills as incredibly important. We do attract people to Northern Ireland on the basis of our skills. We know that whenever we're, we're not the biggest economy in the world, we haven't got the biggest market, uh, we don't have a lot of natural resources, but our, our, our best resource are our people. That's what attracts people to these shores, and I want to keep that, uh, keep that the case. So for his answer, could I ask the Minister, um, given uh, the Belfast City Belfast Chamber of Trade and Commerce. Could I ask the Minister, could he commit to continue working with the Chamber uh, in the time ahead to ensure that whilst they have many laudable objectives and great work behind them, that can we make sure that the Department's investments are put into the city as a whole to make sure that some communities which have heretofore benefit, not really benefit as well as they might, so that Belfast becomes a more fair city as well as a stronger economy city? Yeah. Mr. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm happy to uh, confirmed to the member that I, I'm happy to work with the uh, Belfast Chamber. I haven't met formally with the Belfast Chamber in, in this role, although we would have had a, a good relationship with them uh, in the past. They want to keep that good relationship going in the current post. is very important, as I, as I said, whether it, it is in terms of refocusing our economic strategy or generally about developing our economy as a whole. It's incredibly important that, that I and my departments uh, or my department has, has good relationship with all of the relevant organisations, and Belfast Chamber would obviously be, be part of that, particularly in developing the, in the city. Uh, the member will know that I've, I've spoken, including at the, the committee last week, about the need for yes, we do need to grow our economy, and, and, and our economy is heading in the right direction. Uh, and we see a lot of good data, particularly around unemployment and economic act inactivity coming through. Um, but that has to be that growth has to be inclusive growth. Uh, the new programme for government points to the need to have a, a strong, regionally balanced economy. That's something I believe in, uh, and it's something I know that the member is particularly concerned about, particularly in, in his constituency. Although, in, in, interestingly, it was, and sometimes, sometimes perception is that certain parts of the city or certain parts of the province uh, do less well in terms of investment. But interestingly, looking at, at statistics about West Belfast in the past five years, uh, there have been 93 startups per 10,000 
head of the population in the West Belfast constituency, which I think points to a good entrepreneurial spirit of the people of West Belfast. But that, is, uh, that compares to a 983 uh, average across the whole of Northern Ireland, so better than the uh, Northern Ireland average, and the sixth highest constituency in the whole of the UK. And that has received support from InvestNI, and, and which is now in the hands of, of councils in terms of helping business startups. So, uh, getting regionally balanced and inclusive growth is something that's incredibly important to me and to the executive as a whole, and something that you'll see us focus on uh, over the remainder of this term. Mr. Sammy Douglas. Just following on from the, the previous question about the Belfast Chamber, one of their objectives in their manifesto is to turn Belfast into a tech city. Could the Minister outline to the Chamber what progress he thinks that Belfast has made in this regard? I thank the, the member for, for, for his question. I, I, I think there is a, um, Mr. Speaker, a, a real developing sense that, that Belfast is a hub for uh, digital and tech jobs. In fact, the whole of Northern Ireland is developing that re relationship with the, perhaps Belfast as the anchor for that. And, and you see that, I think, in lots of different ways. Um, you see it firstly by the fact that we are attracting in, in terms of inward investment, a lot of jobs in that digital and that tech space. So I mentioned MetaSwitch, which is 94 jobs um, in the telecommunications sector, some of which are in tech support, but interestingly, a significant number of those jobs are, are in research and development. So it's really good that Northern Ireland is able to attract that particular type of work. Uh, recently, I announced uh, 17 jobs um, in Belfast for a company called BDNA, who are uh, an American firm, a California-based firm, Silicon Valley-based firm, who are coming to Northern Ireland to have a presence here because they see this is a good place to invest, again, because of the skills of our, our workforce. But we're, we're also, as well as attracting those sorts of jobs in, Mr. Speaker, we are developing a reputation, and the member will know sometimes it is that reputation that, as it develops, it gathers momentum. Um, so the BBC, uh, for example, this week, their BBC uh, Tech um, uh, Week has highlighted Belfast as one of the UK's digital tech hubs. It highlights specialisms that we have in, in software development, and, of course, we are Europe's leading destination for software uh, development, and it also highlights um, our, our ongoing good work in the area of cyber security. Uh, and it points to, yes, our FDI, but also our local firms, really, really good local firms, excellent local firms like Kenos, who are putting us on the, on the world map. That follows on from a report by, by Tech City UK, a Tech Nation report for, for 2016, which again shows and highlights Northern Ireland as a growing um, digital cluster, um, talks about us having uh, our tech industries making the highest uh, contribution uh, to GVA, the local economy, with the exception of, of and the whole of the UK, with the exception of, of London and the South East. So you know, our excellent talent, our infrastructure, our low overheads and, and government support are, I think, helping to put Belfast and the whole of Northern Ireland on the, on the international map as a, as a tech hub. Uh, and I think something really special is happening, and we need to uh, make the most of that. I remind the Minister of the two-minute moot rule, um, and before I call Mr Alex Atwood. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I press the Minister? Uh, as you know, there are many voices in Belfast, both in the Chamber of Commerce and in the Council, pressing for the devolution of regeneration powers that was derailed in the last mandate. Not within your gift, but as part of the PFG, are you committed and will you argue with the Minister for Communities and with your executive colleagues for the devolution of regeneration powers to councils? I think the Minister for Communities was just in the House, and the member wasn't in the House for, for his questions. He might have been in for, for an earlier part of it, but I, mean, I, I, would, I would suggest that to the member that is a, a, a question better directed to uh, the Minister. I think that the, this is a, an issue which has, um, I think, regeneration powers um, should be devolved down to councils, but obviously it needs to be done in a way that, um, that they, can, uh, they can take those powers on and make the most of them. I do think that as we look at we want to see our cities and our council areas uh, grow and develop and move forward. That regeneration powers are at the, at the heart of being able to do that. But obviously, I leave it to uh, the Minister for the Communities to decide when the right time to do that is, in, in conjunction with, and I'm sure he will be working very, very closely uh, with his colleagues in local government to ensure that that can happen in a timely fashion. Before I call Mr. Storey for his question, I must inform the House that question number three has been withdrawn. Mr. Storey. Uh, question number two, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I fully recognise the importance of the Dark Hedges as a tourist destination. They are a tremendous tourism asset, not just for the local area, but for Northern Ireland as a whole. When the Dark Hedges were featured at the start of season two of Game of Thrones, they immediately captured the imagination of viewers. There was an instant impact at the Dark Hedges with a huge increase in the volume of visitors from all over the world. 
Subsequently, they have become not just an iconic image from the series, but of Northern Ireland. Game of Thrones has just broken the record for the highest number of Emmy Awards won by any fictional series. It is quite simply, Mr. Speaker, the biggest TV show in the world. Game of Thrones is broadcast in 199 territories, which offers a huge opportunity for Northern Ireland to position itself internationally and to promote our destination to a global audience. With at least two more seasons to be filmed, the audience will continue to grow, as will the demand to visit film locations in Northern Ireland. The show has been a catalyst for business growth with Northern Ireland Screen, estimating the economic value of Game of Thrones production to Northern Ireland as £148 million pounds to date. Mr. Speaker, Tourism NI is building on this success and has been working closely with the industry to develop new and innovative Game of Thrones related visitor experiences and marketing campaigns. Most recently, the Dark Hedge has featured prominently in Tourism NI's collaborative marketing campaign with Tourism Ireland, celebrating season six of Game of Thrones. The videos associated with this campaign, Mr. Speaker, resulted in over 1.2 million, million social media engagements. Story for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for uh, his uh, answer. And I declare an interest uh, as chair of the Preservation Trust uh, of the Dark Hedges. And given the strategic place that it has in terms of uh, tourism in the North Antrim area. Will the Minister welcome the fact that the Causeway Coast and Glens Council have now taken a very proactive role? And I thank the Minister for his help in regards to ensuring that Tourism NI uh, were also recently present at a meeting with the Council so that we can build upon the success but also deal with the challenges because the Minister will be aware that there are particular issues in relation now to preserving the site, also ensuring that locals have adequate and appropriate access, and also that we have in place a system which manages the many hundreds of people, thousands of people indeed, that come to the Dark Hedges now on a very regular basis. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for his question. I also want to thank him and those other members of the Trust for their ongoing work in in seeking to, to preserve the beauty that is the, the, the dark hedges. And I, I visited them for the, uh, the first time this summer, um, and they are absolutely, they're absolutely spectacular. Uh, and you can see why they are such, such an attract attraction and why the, uh, the show wanted to use them. Um, but they are clearly under pressure. I'm aware that m by visiting myself, I was putting them under pressure. There was a huge number of people there uh, that day. Um, and, and there has been a lot of work, uh, and the Preservation Trust has been to the fore in, in this respect. Um, there's been a lot of work that has been done to try to preserve the, the beauty of, of the dark hedges, because if we are going to uh, use them to attract people to Northern Ireland, then we're going to have to preserve them for, for future generations. I know that there have been tree preservation orders in place since 2004, although there have still been difficulties in preserving the trees. Although, interesting, I think it's, it's interesting that we were able to use uh, bad news in terms of some of the trees uh, falling. Uh, for good in terms of creating the doors which have been located around and have themselves become a bit of a tourist attraction in different parts of Northern Ireland. Uh, I know that Transport NI, you know my, my area of responsibility, are looking at a number of traffic management proposals which I think are going to be incredibly important. Um, because if we are going to continue to promote, and, I, and it would be my intention that Tourism NI and Tourism Ireland would continue to promote the dark edges uh, through the Game of Thrones and using Game of Thrones to our, to our advantage, if we are continuing to build on what we did with Season 6 and the fact that we have uh, apps in place now which identify dark hedges and other filming locations which are publicly accessible uh, that we are um, and I screen have been working with the council as the, the member knows to put interpretive panels in place uh, and, and the dark hedges feature in all of tourism Northern Ireland's uh, marketing information around the causeway coastal route and if we're going to continue to do that then we're going to have to ensure that they are preserved and that they are they are still accessible but they are preserved and that they're there for future generations to enjoy Minister is allowed up to two minutes. He doesn't necessarily have to take the two minutes. <laughs> call, call Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think, as the Minister indicated there, the dark ages have been put on the world map because of the Game of Thrones. I wouldn't necessarily have took Mr. Story as a fan, but saying that there's only two, two series le left, is the Minister confident that the film and creative industries are sustainable enough to outlive the series? so that those production companies will keep coming back to locations in North Antrim, Dalriado or West Antrim? I think we can... I think we can... Uh, that's the that's local press statement drafted for this week. Um, I, I think that... Um, I, I think we can, we can focus, uh, as Mr Story's question focuses on, 
on the dark hedges and promoting the dark hedges in, in the short term. And I think that's, you know, we are very, very fortunate to have secured uh, the six series, and there are at least two more series, and who knows what the future holds in terms of, of, of Game of Thrones. Um, and, and Northern Ireland has benefited from that in terms of promoting Northern Ireland, whether it's a, uh, the Dark Hedges or Castle Ward or wherever it might be. There have been a lot of areas that have uh, have reaped the benefit. I was in Ballantoy Harbour as well over the summer, which is in the, the members' constituency. Again, a place which, uh, yeah, a hidden gem in, in Northern Ireland, probably haven't been visited that much in advance of the series coming into the place, but now huge numbers going through there. And tours, uh, I think there are about 20 different tour, tour Game of Thrones tour experiences in Northern Ireland, which are employing people and, and, and providing a service for, for visitors who are coming here. But perhaps the best legacy and, and the most important legacy is the legacy that it leaves for our film and television industry and our creative industries in Northern Ireland. So we have studios in Titanic, which are, are, are full. Uh, we have new studios developing on the other side of uh, Giants Park, on the other side of the lock. You have studios in Bam Bridge. Uh, there are opportunities for Northern Ireland to be used as filming locations for, for many, many years to come. And I was looking at uh, statistics over the weekend from the um, National Association of Theatre Owners in the States, which shows the, the huge increase in the number of films being made and released in the United States just alone. Uh, and whenever you look at studios, big studios in London, which are full, and studios looking for capacity and space to make films in Northern Ireland is very, very well positioned in the future and with the expertise that we have developed uh, through filming Game of Thrones here in Northern Ireland. Well, Mr. Philip McGuigan. Uh, uh, can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far and his uh, praise uh, for the local Causeway Coast and Glens Council, of which I was recently a member? Uh, just given the importance that the Minister has placed on the Dark Hedges as an environmental and tourism, uh, attraction. How does he envisage the long-term management, given the cross-cutting nature of his department, other departments, uh, you know, the local heritage trust, the tree preservation, and the council? You know, who, who does he envisage taking the lead in terms of future management? I, I'd, I'd be honest with him, and, and, and you know, say that I, we haven't yet to give some specific thought as to how that might be done. Obviously, there are a lot of actors involved, excuse the pun, involved in this, from the, the preservation trust, the council, tourism, NI. Uh, local stakeholders involved in it all. So I think that, that, that is part of the conversation which uh, Mr. Uh, Story alluded to, which has already started to take place and has happened on the ground at the, at the Dark Hedges about what... I, I think our first priority has got to be preserving um, the site. And then I think there's a temptation, you know, to be completely honest, perhaps on, on our side and tourism side of things, is just trying to market these and not necessarily thinking about the environmental impact. That, that is incredibly important to me, as I said before. There's nothing to market if they're not there in the future, so we've got to look after them first and foremost. That's where we would look to the uh, Preservation Trust and, and uh, to, to lead in terms of that and show us the, uh, the best way forward in regards to, that, to pre preserve the asset as, a, as an asset. Uh, and then and from a tourism perspective, we'd be very, very happy to step in. I think there is much more that we can do uh, at the Dark Hedges. I know that the, uh, the local the hotel and the resort beside it is developing further, and I think they see huge opportunities. In fact, I think they're rebranding uh, to call themselves the Dark Hedges Resort. So there's there's huge opportunities. We will work very very closely with them, with them to do that. But you know, I do look to colleagues in the uh, Environment Agency. I look to colleagues in um, Transport NI to ensure that we can preserve the asset first and foremost, and then it is very much over to us in combination with the local council and the preservation trust to ensure that the, the asset is marketed in a way that can benefit everybody, but also in a, in a sympathetic way. Well, Mr. Jim Ollis. Uh, I think as the minister recognises the Dark Hedges has been the victim of its own success, uh, but is it not rather neglectful <clears throat> that in terms of looking after it and exploiting it to the maximum degree? that's compatible with its future, that there isn't a structured management arrangement, given there are so many cross-cutting departments within interest and council. Uh, I was rather surprised with an answer six months or so ago from the department that there are no structures, for example, in place uh, with the Preservation Trust from departments such as the ministers. Uh, and is it not imperative? that there is more structure brought to this because there are many local residents who have their own concerns. There are issues about access and transport NI issues, and yet there's the capacity because of the lack of structure for passing the buck. Uh, is it not time there was more structured input? I think I agree with the member that it has in many respects been a victim of its, of its own success. 
And I think that if people um, range of different organisations, my own uh, department in terms of tourism and I included, were perhaps caught out, it was I don't think anybody could have foreseen how how big a success it would be. And I don't know. I'm sure the member is a, a huge fan of the show. Uh, he will know that it only appears. Uh, it only appears. Uh, I'm sure he's binging on box sets all the time. Um, <laughs> It only appears in the end, and he will know it without spoiling it for anybody. It only appears in the show for about 10 seconds. But out of that 10 seconds, oh, no, I'm not giving any spoilers as to who dies, but most of them do. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it only appears for a brief, brief moment. Um, yet out of that, we have got the success in terms of the number of people visiting, not just from, I mean, part of the pressure is um, from tour buses and a large number of tour buses coming up and down a, a road which was not designed for tour buses. Uh, in, in terms of moving forward on this, I know that the Council is now very much taking a, a lead in trying to bring people together. Uh, the Preservation Trust is, is, is very important to that. And, and, and conversations, as I intimated before, sorry, Mr Story intimated before, have already started about what we may do in the future. First and foremost, as I said in response to Mr McGuigan, to preserve the dark hedges. I think that's an, the, the most important thing that we can do, and then what we can do then beyond that to, to market and promote the dark hedges in a way that's, that doesn't in the future jeopardise the dark hedges and, and doesn't ruin what has been a, what is a fantastic asset in the local area, um, something that's uh, wonderfully spectacular uh, and is attracting people from far and wide to come to Northern Ireland. Well, Mr. Declan Kearney. Question four. Mr. Speaker, since their introduction in 2005 and 2012, respectively, the Northern Ireland Renewables Obligation and Renewable Heat Incentive Schemes have successfully supported the development of the renewables industry in Northern Ireland. Around a quarter of our electricity needs are now met through renewable technologies such as wind, solar, photo photovoltaic, combined heat and power, and hydro. With a further 700 megawatts of committed projects with grid connection offers, I am confident the Executive's 2020 target of 40 per cent can be achieved over the next few years. Similarly, almost 4,800 renewable heating systems have been installed in homes and businesses. Current estimates uh, suggest that over 6% of our heating needs are now provided through technologies such as biomass, heat pumps and solar thermal. The Northern Ireland Renewables obligation is now closed to new onshore wind applications and will be closing to applicants for other technologies from March 2017. Existing renewable generation will continue to be supported by Northern Ireland electricity consumers for 20 years. Similarly, despite closure of the renewable heat incentive scheme, will continue to support existing renewable heating generation for up to 20 years. Looking to the future beyond the Northern Ireland Renewables Obligation and Renewable Heat Incentive Schemes, I will consider the future di uh, direction of renewable energy policy within the context of wider energy strategy development and ensuring energy costs for all consumers in Northern Ireland remain as low as possible. To achieve this, it is my opinion that we need a, an informed debate around wider energy policy in Northern Ireland on what we realistically expect our energy system to deliver, what aspects of it we are prepared to invest in, and who pays for this. It is, Mr Speaker, my intention to initiate that wider debate in the coming weeks and months. Mr Kearney for supplementary. Uh, that was a helpful answer to my, my first question. The, the CNAG report into the non-domestic uh, renewable uh, heating initiative scheme has found that the operation of that scheme will result in devastating costs to the Northern Bloc grant for a period of uh, 20 years and more. We will see a loss of tens of millions, indeed hundreds of millions of pounds to our, uh, to our Bloc grant. That will be a cost to the Executive. The Public Accounts Committee will commence it's hearing into this issue right, on, uh, on Wednesday. Have you, have you read the report, Minister, and can you indicate how your department would intend to deal with the, the huge and the serious fallout and financial and economic implications from this scheme? Mr. Speaker, I, I, I have read the, the uh, Audit Office report, and I do know that it is subject to a hearing of the PAC this week. I know the member is, is new to the House, but he will appreciate that it would not be appropriate for me to comment on uh, investigations that the PAC would be having uh, uh, that are currently live. Uh, but I am looking forward uh, to that hearing, and I have said consistently 
in response to this issue around the renewable heat incentive, Mr. Speaker, that you know there are a lot of lessons to learn, and I will be more than happy to listen to and respond appropriately to all recommendations that are made by the PAC, the Audit Office, or, or whoever. Um, we are working very, very hard to uh, mitigate the loss. In fact, I've had conversations with the, the member's colleague, the Finance Minister, around that particular issue. Um, I have uh, in, launched a, recently launched an investigation which is underway, and I don't want to get into the details of, of what that is finding. Uh, needless to say that it, an investigation into the uh, allegations, the very serious allegations of fraud and abuse of the scheme has been undertaken by external consultants. Uh, and that is producing some interesting findings, Mr. Uh, Speaker, which will obviously be fed into the whole process as well. But I do take the issue exceptionally seriously. Um, it's very, very clear from my review of the evidence presented to me that uh, ministers f followed official advice, but that that advice was, was flawed, uh, and that there is a cost as a consequence of all of that. But I will be, and I can assure the member that I'll be working very, very hard, listening to the helpful input from the Audit Office and the PAC, and taking all possible actions that there are to mitigate that cost moving forward. Well, Mr. Patsy McLaughlin. Leo Lashkian Corlea, thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister, is he aware of any issue with payments from Ofgem to businesses associated with the renewable sector? I know I've previously had to write to the Minister and, and thank him for his department's intervention on that occasion, because clearly that would have an impact on businesses and those who have expended quite a bit of money uh, in formulating projects and putting them on the ground. I'm not aware of any, any trend in respect of, of the issue that the member makes, but I mean, if, if there is further evidence that he has, Mr. Speaker, on payments, and I'm not clear um, what type of payments that he is talking about, I'm sure Ofgem, off as he would expect, would be robust in ensuring that all payments are, are due and are, um, uh, you know, should be made. I think there was. Um, as I'm reflecting on it, as I'm speaking, I think there was there was some issues around some payments that we made, which were which were dealt with on an individual case by case basis after some intervention from from my department. But if he or indeed any other members have, have come across similar issues and that they think uh, would benefit from the intervention of, of me and, and the department, uh, I would encourage them to come forward to me at, at, uh, as quickly as possible. Call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the minister for his answers today. Can the minister give us his assessment? of the Executive's renewable policy and how we compare with the rest of the United Kingdom? Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I think our, our renewables policy, particularly the renewables obligation, has um, I suppose it depends how you judge success, but I, I, I would judge it as, as successful in, in, in several different ways. Um, I mentioned in my, my answer that there are uh, 700 megawatts of renewable pro uh, projects which currently have grid connection offers. Uh, and I understand that there are 200 uh, megawatts worth of offers still to be made, and that is on top of uh, 900 megawatts of renewable energy, which is already online. Um, and, and that will all combine, Mr. Speaker, to, to help the executive to meet its 2020 target of 40% of electricity being generated through renewable sources. Our, our, our peak demand would be in a, a midweek uh, day in the, in the winter time, that would be around 1,800 megawatts, when the average demand is around 1,200. Um, but what that capacity that we already have on, online, what we have in terms of the offers that are made and the offers to be made, all adds up to a position where we would have the capacity to meet 100% uh, of demand through the renewables. Uh, and that then, that then not only allows us to meet our 40% target, but also would match with the Scottish target, which is a different target, which is, a, which is to have 100% renewables capacity. So within the next number of years, we will also meet that. And sometimes we are, we are compared with Scotland, and sometimes and have heard us unfavourably compared with Scotland. But we are on course to meet not only our own executive target of 40%, which is the old PFG, but also to similarly meet what the Scottish have had as their, their, their target. I think it has, by and large, uh, as a policy, been, been successful, but it has been successful with, with consequences. Uh, and Mr Kearney's question alluded to some of those. It has been costly. Um, and resources are certainly a factor in considering future renewables policy, which we'll do in the context of, the, of a renewed energy uh, policy framework. And there's also an impact in terms of grid capacity, and the member will be aware of difficulties some people have had of getting connections onto the grid, uh, and that our grid infrastructure is insufficient uh, in many respects. So there, it has made a success, but there has been consequences. I stress the need for a quick question from Kelly Armstrong and a quick response from the minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I just ask the Minister quite quickly what discussion he has had with renewal e renewable energy providers given the current vacuum in energy policy? Well, I, I, have, 
um, had a range of discussions with lots of different people from the energy sector, and I have a, um, a meeting in the diary. Uh, I can't remember exactly when, but a meeting in the diary with uh, renewable sector representative organisation in the next number of, of weeks, um, which I'm you know, happy to discuss some of the issues and I'm sure that they will raise. I, 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 the member describes it as a vacuum. I think there is, given what I have outlined, in that you know, we have 900 megawatts of renewable energy already on, on the grid, uh, 700 with offers to go onto the grid and then a further 200 to be put onto the grid, which would allow us to meet 1,800 megawatts, which is our, our peak, peak daily demand. I, I think it is an opportunity, and there are lots of reasons and circumstances as to why the, uh, the Naira is, is coming to an end, has ended for someone, will come to an end. But I think it is an opportune moment to, in, in concert with the renewable sector and, and the broad energy sector, and indeed, indeed wider society, to have a discussion about what future renewables policy might be. Concludes the period for listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mrs. Sander Overend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the autumn review of broadband contracts? I, 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 I didn't quite catch it. the autumn review or the, the autumn. Uh, there, there's a um, obviously we, we have a good track record in terms of broadband. In Northern Ireland, we were the first region in the UK, indeed the first region in Europe, that had 100% broadband connectivity. Um, we have invested. That has come as a result of an investment in, of uh, £64 million by this executive, which has been in large part matched by private sector providers to ensure that uh, our, our uh, telecommunications infrastructure has improved over the last number of years. I, I'm keen to see that continue. Uh, I'm keen to do that in concert with the, the private sector providers. Um, um, I will give the member, I'll write to the member, and I'm not, I don't have a, an update to hand in respect of the review that she's talking about, but I'm, I'm happy to come back to the member about that. Well, Ms. Overend for a supplementary. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to receiving that information from the Minister. I'm sure he will appreciate the large a uh, number of entrepreneurial uh, people in the, my Middlesex constituency and how important broadband is to them. But I really would like the minister to be able to advise what the, that review will involve, what specific contracts will be examined, what timescale um, can be uh, will be expected for the completion of that autumn review. Yeah, and, and Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm, provided, I'm happy to provide the, the member with, with all of that, that detail. I, I, I think that our you know, I, I, notwithstanding the, the issues that she and pretty much everybody in this House will raise about um, the standard of broadband connectivity within their constituencies, and I think there, there is a, I know the member represents a constituency in the west of the province, and I think there's sometimes a perception that this is only or largely a problem in the west of the province. So there are a lot of members here who represent east of the province constituencies who will be able to tell you that, particularly in rural parts of, of Northern Ireland, that they can't always get the speeds that, that people would like. And the member is right that it is an increasingly an issue for uh, businesses and businesses who are wanting to connect globally and do their, their business internationally uh, need to have, for lots of different reasons, need to have good broadband uh, connectivity. Um, I mentioned already the £64 million that we've invested since 2008, and that has helped us to, to, to radically improve our broadband infrastructure. And Superfast is now available to 77 premises in Northern Ireland, which, and 38 pr premises have taken Superfast broadband up, which compares to the UK average of, of 33 per cent. Uh, and that has come as a result of a, a large number of initiatives, including a broadband improvement project, which we've invested nearly 24 million pounds in. Um, but sometimes, again, I said this in the House um, two weeks ago at question time, that there is a bit of an obsession with fibre connections, and whilst everybody wants to get fibre, and I completely understand that, there are a range of alternative technologies available, particularly uh, in rural parts of Northern Ireland where they can't get fibre that easily, which can, can deliver at decent broadband speed. So I'm happy to come back to the member, Mr. Speaker, on, on the issue that she has particularly raised and give her a bit more detail on it. I think it is appropriate that, to look at these contracts from time to time. I think it is important that we, yes, work with private sector providers, but make sure that they are providing value for money as well, uh, and to make sure that they are doing the job that we want them to do. Mr. Mark Durkin is not in his place. I call Mr. Daniel McCrossan. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answers so far. The Minister will be aware that my constituency, a border constituency, has benefited significantly from EU funding, receiving almost £300 million over the past five years. As a pro-Brexiteer in his influential position of government, how does he propose the financial shortfall be filled or replaced? Mr. Speaker, I, I, I'm, you know, the member is, uh, is back to the same well again after two weeks ago asking about, about Brexit. Whenever he was, uh, he was complaining two weeks ago about the benefits of uh, the um, 
the referendum result in his constituency where he was seeing booming cross-border trade. And he was complaining about that and he was complaining about, I think, about exporters seeing uh, great success over the last number of weeks and, and months. Uh, and again, I you know, apologise to the, the, the member that all of his predictions uh, or the predictions of doom and gloom that he uh, subscribed to haven't uh, come to pass. Um, you know, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it is, it is interesting that it's really the number of people who the number of people who talked about, you know, a deep recession coming into place. I mean, that, um, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Reagan as well. He had, he had within, within days of, within, 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 within days of the, uh, within days of the referendum. Of course, Mr. Reagan had dispensed with the need, uh, Mr. Speaker, to have the ONS do its job and declare whether or not we were in a recession. A recession, of course, being two quarters of negative growth within about three days. Mr. Reagan had put the UK into, uh, into recession. Uh, the, Office of National the Office of National Statistics have now come out and said the referendum appears not to have had a major effect on the economy. So there we go. So we will we'll, 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 um, we'll listen to the ONS and what they're saying now, and not Mr. Reagan, who dispensed with the need for them. But in respect of look, the member, the member touches on the impact. Are, are, is there an impact? Will there be challenges? Are there issues to deal with? Absolutely, there are. Absolutely, there are. But what we are focused on, Mr. Speaker, absolutely focused on, is getting the best possible deal for Northern Ireland. We've been working very, very hard over the summer period. We will continue to work through the autumn to inform the government in terms of their position in the negotiations. We've been informing them particularly of Northern Ireland's particular circumstances. We've done that in direct meetings I have with Liam Fox and, and Greg Clark and David Davis, and we will continue to do that to ensure that the, uh, the Westminster government and the new Prime Minister knows the particular circumstances that Northern Ireland faces and the deal that we want to get. To be causing for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his, for his answer. I wouldn't say it's complaining, Minister. I'd say it's delivering a message from the ground, and I'm sure you've heard it loud and clear at this stage. Uh, Minister, you've, you've talked about benefits and what the benefits will be when Brexit comes, and Brexit has not yet come, Minister. But when it comes, what are these great benef benefits that you're telling us about? What will they be? You know, the, the, mem the member has, you know, the member is wishing to go back over a referendum campaign which was, which was fought and, from his perspective, was lost. Uh, many months ago, and there, there, I think there are, there are, and I'm perfectly content with the outcome of the referendum. There are a huge number, in my view, benefits to, to be accrued for not just for the United Kingdom but for, for Northern Ireland in particular. Um, you know, the, the very fact that uh, our country will again con regain control in respect of our borders, regain control in respect of our budget, and regain control in respect of our laws is incredibly important. And, and for years and years and years, our ability to, and this is where I think it is incredibly beneficial to Northern Ireland, in a, in a small market like ours with 1.8 million people where we have to look outside of Northern Ireland uh, if we are wanting to grow our economy, our trade has been restricted to other growing parts. And let's not forget, you know, the Eurozone has suffered considerably over the last number of years, has been in decline in large parts for the last number of years. There are huge opportunities beyond Europe to trade to the Middle East, the Far East, to South America and to other parts of the world, which have, and to North America as well, which have been encumbered by the fact that we have been members of the European Union. And I look forward to the opportunities that, that, that uh, being outside of the European Union will present for Northern Ireland and for British companies to export uh, beyond Europe. Uh, and that's what I have been focused on, in, particularly in discussions with Liam Fox, uh, to ensure that Northern Ireland is perfectly placed, Mr. Speaker, perfectly placed to take advantage of the opportunities that will accrue after uh, the UK leaves the European Union. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, given the Minister's objective and indeed the departmental objective of growing our economy, would the Minister acknowledge that any growth in the economy is highly dependent on expenditure on infrastructure and Given our situation with Brexit looming and the, the political landscape in terms of trying to fund such projects, can the Minister advise me what conversations he has had at the executive table in prioritising the projects that he sees critical to the growth of the economy and the funding of those projects? The issue of infrastructure funding, you know, I, I accept the, the, the basic premise of the member's question that infrastructure uh, expenditure is good for the economy. Uh, I was in charge of the finance department for a number of years and very, very keen to, to try everything that we possibly could to increase uh, the amount of capital expenditure that we had, uh, because I acknowledge that if you, if you want to improve and you want to grow your economy, uh, and having the best economic infrastructure that you possibly can in terms of energy and telecoms, which we were talking about earlier, and also road infrastructure is incredibly important for, for any economy, particularly an economy like ours, but it also, in the short term, 
quite evidently, Mr. Speaker, provides uh, a, a short-term boost for the economy as pe more people are employed and more aggregates are used and so on and so forth. So on the, on the basic premise of the Member's question, I absolutely accept that more infrastructure investment is, is good for our economy. In terms of taking that forward, that is an issue for the executive as a whole. Um, I will be making bids for infrastructure investment around telecoms, around tourism infrastructure, around a range of different infrastructure uh, aspects. Now, uh, the, the member uh, and her party wishes to tie everything back to uh, the referendum result, but she will know, and if she doesn't, she, if she looks at the figures, she will see that our capital expenditure as a nation and right across the UK has been on the rise in recent times and, and doesn't appear to be affected by uh, any referendum result at all. Uh, in fact, the media re uh, reports at the weekend suggest that the Prime Minister is incredibly keen to boost even beyond what the initial projections were, capital expenditure, recognising that it does provide both a short and a long-term boost to the economy. For supplementary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister, for his answer so far. Given, um, as a member from the South Down constituency, I would like to afford the Minister an opportunity to perhaps put on record his support for a critical project in the narrow water bridge for the development of the tourism sector across South Down. And it was always envisaged that that project would be part funded by this House, the Southern Government and European funding. One, can he give us assurance that he supports the project? And two, that he has started to seek out possible holes in that funding package? There is a project, Mr. Um, Mr Speaker, which the Executive and the Irish Government have been committed to in, in principle. And Obviously, it, it fell through at a previous time for a, a range of different reasons. Um, um, uh, and if a bid comes forward for future funding for it, obviously that will have to be uh, dealt with in the appropriate way through the appropriate system to ensure that there is, uh, it is a, a beneficial scheme, produces all of the, you know, has a business case in place, and, and all of the rest of it. But it is a, it is a project which, which I, the executive, and the Irish government ha have supported in principle and will continue to do so. Well, Mr. Edwin Poots. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could the Minister update us on the year of food and drink? Mr. Mr. Speaker, the, the, the year of food and drink uh, has been a huge success for Northern Ireland so far. Obviously, we're not, we're not finished with it yet. Uh, we're only uh, nine months through of it. But I think it was a, a really exciting initiative that was put in place and has presented us with a, a great opportunity to celebrate uh, Northern Ireland's food and drink. Uh, the member, from, particularly from his farming background, will know that Northern Ireland has always had a fantastic food and drink uh, product, um, which is get on food and drink offering, which has only improved over the last number of years. Um, I, I think that we have, we have known that we have had a great product um, in both food and drink, but we haven't perhaps let the world know that we've got a great product. And I think that's, that has what has been changing over the last number of years and has been highlighted, particularly, Mr. Speaker, by the year of, of, of food and drink. Uh, it was great to see um, that we are now being acknowledged by others. Uh, and the recent UK Great Taste Awards, uh, Northern Ireland Food and Drink won 303 gold medals. Or gold stars, sorry, gold medals. That was more the uh, Olympics and Paralympics, obviously. But we got 303 gold stars. It was a fantastic achievement, best ever achievement for the Northern Ireland food and drink sector. And I think shows that um, the year of food and drink has helped to highlight and helped to promote a wonderful sector, which is which is absolutely key to our economy, key to our tourism product, uh, and hopefully we'll go to str from strength to strength in the years ahead. Mr. Bridge for a supplement. How will the success of the year of food and drink uh, be judged? I know that I'm not much of a drinker, but I'm not a bad eater. And I know no, 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 Northern Ireland does have some excellent food. Well, Mr. I, I, I think we've done. Uh, I, I mean, I think it has been successful already. I think you, when you look at the, in lots of different ways, if you look at the buy in that there has been from, uh, I mean, obviously, this was a go, uh, food NI and tourism NI initiative. A government-led initiative, but it has been supported by a large number of, um, you know, by some of the supermarkets, by some of the big food producers in Northern Ireland. People have really, really got on board with the, the whole year of food and drink uh, agenda uh, and taken it to their hearts to use it as a use it as something to help to promote their their businesses. Yes, but also to promote uh, food and drink. Um, and the food and drink sector in, in Northern Ireland. And, and I, I think it, it, it had a number of objectives were set around increasing the level of, of visitor satisfaction, developing new food experiences, and developing uh, the skills of the sector. There's a whole range of objectives that were set. So obviously, whenever the year is over, we will go back over those and, and test all of those. But I, we don't want it all, either, Mr. Speaker, to be just a one off and a one year of food and drink. We need to build on the success that we've already clearly had, and in some respects, make every year a year of food and drink in Northern Ireland. 
Mr. Middleton, for a question, and we may not get to your, top, your supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the highly successful Maiden City Festival within my own constituency. Uh, will he work to ensure that tourism in London and the North West is well represented in the new tourism strategy? Mr. Speaker, yes, absolutely. I can give the, the member and, and the people in his constituency that assurance. Uh, the Maiden City Festival, which he, he cites, is a hugely important uh, part of the calendar and something that has attracted a large number of visitors to, uh, to Londonderry. It is something that I know we have supported through Tourism I in, in recent years, including this year, uh, and look forward to doing so in the future and building on the success of, of what has been a tremendous event down through the years. That ends the time for questions to the Minister. I ask the